On some systems that require above average levels of security, you don't just have to type in your password in order to log in, you also receive a text message on your phone with an access code that you then have to type in as well. But some systems go even further than that. In those systems, you can't just use your phone to receive a text message. You have to use a dedicated hardware device like this, which provides you with an access code to log in. Now, a device like this is called a security token, and in this video, we're going to take a look at how those work. So the weird thing about security tokens is that they don't connect to the server in any way. So with the text message based authentication system, that's that's rather straightforward to understand, right? The server generates a random number, which is the access code. It then sends this number to your phone number through a text message. You take this number, you type it in, you press enter, the number gets sent over to the server. And if the number matches the original number that the server generated, then the server knows this person has his phone because otherwise he wouldn't be able to receive the text message with the number in it. The problem with the security token based system is that the security token has no way of communicating with the server. So this device right here, this doesn't have Wi-Fi, it doesn't have Bluetooth, it doesn't have a SIM card, it doesn't have a satellite uh, internet connection system or something like that built into it. This has no way of connecting to the server that we're logging into. So then how does it know the right access code for us to log in? The answer to that, to that depends on what kind of security token we're talking about. The first kind of security token that you'll find is the static password security token. And I think that this, this device shouldn't even be called a security token. So this type of security token simply contains a password in its memory somewhere and it simply knows this password and it's always the same password. So this kind of security token is the equivalent of a password written down on a piece of paper. There is nothing special about this device, okay? It simply knows a second password. So you type in your own password when you log in, uh, the server will say, oh great, that's the right password. Now please fill in the code from the access token or the security token. Uh, and that code is always the same. So this kind of security token simply is simply a memory device that knows a password. Most of the time, these kinds of tokens connect to the computer through USB or something like that, uh, so that they automatically transmit the code instead of showing it on a screen, because that would be a security risk, of course. The second kind of security token uses a clock. Okay, so this is a rather interesting system. This security token has a couple of features built into it. First of all, it has a microprocessor that is capable of performing cryptographic operations. It also has some memory that contains a secret key, a secret code that only the server knows. So only the server knows this code and it's also in the memory of the security token. Nobody else knows this. Not even the owner of the token knows this code. And finally, there is also a clock built into this security token. And this, this is where the genius part comes in. When this system is initially set up, the clock of the server is synchronized with the clock of the security token. So their clocks are synchronized and they start counting up from that point on. Um, and most of the time they start counting how many 30 second blocks have gone by. But for this video, let's say to keep to keep things simple, they're counting how many minutes have gone by since these clocks were synchronized. So you have to imagine we have these these two clocks. We have a clock in the server and a clock in the token. We synchronize them. And from that point on, these two clocks start counting how many minutes have gone by since we synchronized them. Now, what happens when you're trying to log in is the following. You type in your normal password, you press enter, the server says, okay, that's correct. Now what the server will do is it will take the current value of its clock. So how many minutes have gone by since the moment uh, of synchronization? It'll take that value. It'll also take its secret key that nobody knows. 
it'll combine these two values, it produces a hash of the value of its clock at this moment, because the value of its clock is changing every minute, of course, combined with the value that is the secret key. And this hash can't be reversed, right? So hashing is a one-way process. You can't undo hashing. So that'll produce a certain hash, a certain random-looking pile of garbage. Then the server will simplify this hash into an eight-digit code, for example. At the same time, the user who's trying to log into the server will press the button on their security token, and the security token does exactly the same thing as the server. It takes the current value of its clock and the secret key it knows, it combines those, it hashes them, and then it simplifies the hash into an eight-digit code. This code then appears on the screen of the security token, and the user can type it into the website, for example. The user presses enter, the code is sent to the server, and the server compares it to the code that it generated itself. And if those two codes are the same, the server knows this user must have the device, right? Because only this device knows the secret code, the secret key that is needed, and only this device has the same clock value. And those two values are necessary in order to generate the same code as the server did. The disadvantage of this is that the clocks can get desynchronized over time because the clock in the token might be running at a slightly different speed than the clock in the server. Um, which means if we're using one minute blocks, then it's not going to matter that much. Uh, but if we're using 30 second blocks, it's going to matter a bit more. If we're using smaller blocks, such as 15 or 10 seconds, it's going to matter a lot. And these clocks can get out of sync in just a couple of years. And that's a real problem. So we can also use a counter-based solution. So in a counter-based solution, instead of using a clock value, a time value, we use a counter that counts how many times we've already logged into the system. So in the beginning, the counter is zero at the server, and the counter at the token is also zero. The first time we log in, we press the button on the token, and the counter becomes one. On the server, the counter also becomes one because we've already typed in the password and attempted to log in. Um, so if we're logging in for the 26th time, well then, um, the counter is also going to be 26 on the token and on the server. So in this case, we're not counting how many minutes have gone by since these clocks were synchronized. We're counting how many times we've logged in since the system was set up. But also, this system has a disadvantage too. And that is that if I take my security token and someday I accidentally press the button without really trying to log into the server, the counter on this device is now no longer the same as the counter on the server. And now we're never able to log in anymore. So that's a real problem. So both systems have their pros and cons. Finally, there is also a completely different system uh, a completely different system that does involve a connection between the server and the security token. In this system, it's called the cryptographic challenge system, by the way, the server generates a specific code, okay, a random code for this specific instance. That code needs to be manipulated in some way by the security token and then the output of that is checked by the server. So how does that work? Well, let's say we have a very advanced security token. We have a really advanced security token. The server, we, we logged in using our normal password already. Then the server gives us a code. That code we have to type into our security token and press enter, okay? Then the security token will process this code. What it will do is it will encrypt this code with its secret key. And remember, the secret key of this security token is only known by the server and the security token itself. Nobody else knows this key. So it takes the 10-digit code we, we typed in, it encrypts it using its secret key, and sends the result on this display. And then we type in that result, send it to the server, and the server knows, since it also has the private key, what the outcome should be. 
right? It knows what the result is going to be. And if that result is indeed the right one, the server knows we must have possession of the right security token because otherwise, how would we know the, sec uh, the secret key? And this is used in... So in this example, that was really inconvenient where we had the code on the screen, we had to type it into a device, the device gave us a code back and we had to type in the code again on the screen. So usually this is used in systems where the security token can already communicate directly with the computer anyway. So the security token will simply plug into the PC using a USB cable and then the, uh, the server's randomly generated code is automatically transferred into the device and then it can also automatically transfer its result back to the server without the user having to type in all this nonsense. A great example of, of cryptographic challenge-based system are uh, smart cards. And a good example of a smart card is a bank card. That little chip you see on a bank card is actually a full-fledged full computer, really. Um, and it's able to receive a cryptographic challenge from the bank, uh, perform a certain operation, and return a certain result. And then the bank is able to determine if it was really the right card. Well, anyway... Um, that is some more information on security tokens and also smart cards for that matter. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video and of course thank you for watching.